Welcome back all my 40K fanatics. I'm DJ here with Tim's Nation. And today I want to talk to you about a simple topic. That is how to practice 40K by yourself. And many ways that you can practice your army when going to a GT and you don't have another friend to test out the game against. Also at the same time too, within a 40K game, you the length of time tends to get extended and you have a lot of turns that, you know, you know, three hours go by and how, what did you gain from that full, full, full game? A lot of high-level competitive players will agree that majority of games, the biggest, import, most important parts of it happen in the early send points of the game. Those are going to eclipse anything that you do late in the game. While late game plays may topple the table and win it, a lot of games can be won and lost in the first two turns, all the way down to just deployment alone. So in this video, I had to mess around with a bunch of titles and names, and it's going to be difficult to not say something that's like a Freudian slip about being in the basement and uh, being alone with a table and some toys. Yeah. Well, we'll do our best here on the, on the channel. So anyways, let's jump over. Guys, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do turn on the bell for notification. Get notified on all the content we bring here on the channel, both competitive and casual focused. And uh, yeah, let's jump over into, uh, oh, what do we say? How to, how, to, uh, how to spend your alone time in your basement. You know what? We're just going to go with it. So everyone, I I've talked to a lot of people who say, man, DJ, I can't get enough time on the table. I, I feel like I'm not getting enough games, you know, or, with some of the people in my play group or with my work schedule. I just can't practice to get to that high level. And I remember that when, in some of my days when, you know, uh, whether work was in the way of that stuff or simply because my job made it very difficult to be able to find people to get games with because of a time frame in scheduling how I was able to practice 40K and continue to practice. The number one thing that you need is a table to play on. <clears throat> you can't mitigate this. I've seen some people try and do half side table or smaller tables and everything like that. You're really losing a lot of vision. You need to be able to fully see the entire table for what you're doing. Uh, because not only are you going to be able to see what you're trying to do, but you're able to see what your army is able to see, your firing lanes and everything else into that. Now, on top of that, you need to have terrain of some sort that you coherently understand for the event or gaming function that you plan on going to. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean for terrain coherently available to you? So there is basically going to be three types of ways that you're going to play this game. Either you got that one buddy who you are getting involved with and, and you're just playing Warhammer with that one friend. So then either you have their terrain collection or you have the terrain collection. In which case, you have both determined what the terrain will do. And now this takes us from a casual aspect over into a newer to casual aspect, over into the competitive aspect of declaring terrain. This is a very, very useful piece of information, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Clarification of terrain before you begin the game is probably one of the top five most important things you're doing when you walk up to the table. Remember, when you go up to the table at a main event, you are at least signing a contracted commitment to try to have a clean, fully understandable game with someone else. You are investing three hours of your time, as are they. So in this, you should attempt to, because this is a game. 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 I can't emphasize enough. You need to try to emphasize with your opponent what you expect terrain to do. As Lane and myself have said many times in the channel, we have declared and we've discussed ahead of time what the terrain will represent. We know that our centerpieces are rooms. However, when you touch them, you can see through them, regardless of any windows or where they are. 
Once you move up to them, it's assumed you can just see through and be seen as well. However, our corner pieces, because these are where armies are deployed and it, in tournament settings is a very, very typical and common thing. Our corner pieces do have first floor blocking. So again, regardless of any windows, you cannot see through the first floor blocking rooms. This allows us to be able to have more terrain and more flexibility behind our units and not feel like we're in a complete shooting gallery. Some armies that have a higher long range output, as we've seen from Admech, Tau, and even Space Marines, could lead to a feels bad and a ruined game experience that also neutralizes a lot of close combat based armies such as World Eaters, Gene Stealer Cult, or even Tyranets. So that is why we use the Games Workshop terrain layout. Games Workshop terrain layout is difficult for some TO organizers to be able to put together because it does consist of quite a bit of terrain. However, it does, <clears throat> we have seen a huge increase to a lot in the Great Lakes area with a lot of terrain being out there. So it's not as uncommon to see close to, if not exactly replicated, Games Workshop style terrain placements. Uh, also, it's measured out nicely. It's very clean and some of them are very creative ideas. So that's why we use the GW terrain layout because it allows us to practice before a GT. Now, once we know a GT we're going to, and the terrain pack is usually a tournament pack is put out in there usually declares what type of terrain they're going to be doing uh, with some of the ones that we've gone to as of late we do see where they use games workshop and they choose like we're going to use setup b and setup c those are going to be the two main formats so that we know what we're practicing and that's number one getting the table set up based on the event or game style that you're going to be playing so from a casual aspect, if you're setting up the table, you may be setting up the table for your friend to come over, or you're setting up the table based on what your friend or buddy has set up at their place and using similar terrain. Again, clarifying what all the terrain is going to do before you even deploy a single unit, before you roll a dice, before you know a deployment zone, even before you know the mission, what, how is the terrain functioning? I personally recommend that you make sure that the corners have full like first floor line of sight blocking units. This allows you to be able to deploy your army safely to be able to get past not going first and be able to play the game for its all intensive purposes. Now, if your friend is pushing back to and goes, oh, well, we'll figure it out as we go, figure it out as we go. I would definitely recommend that you say, no, we should establish this now because again, this is a game. Every, we want to have fun. Okay, so how do we establish what the terrain does? Well, you look at the terrain in the rule book. When you look at barricades and things like that, barricades, fuel pipes and stuff, while can be feasible pieces of terrain, typically end up kind of getting washed past because of the fact that that they don't provide too, too much to the overall scheme of the game, um, where runes are kind of the staple of Warhammer, as far as what I've seen it, in my opinion. Runes apply a almost paint competitive paintball aspect on the table, where it is, you can't be seen, you can't be seen. Although some of this may not seem as realistic per se wartime, this comes into the realm of it being a game. Now, on the casual maybe uh, as often referred to the fluffy side of things, fuel pipes and stuff like that may be a necessity for your mission and for your game. So declare that ahead of time. Go through those. There's only like, I think it's five terrain pieces. So it's not difficult to be able to label them. And at first, if you're tr learning the game, take a note card, fold it in half like a triangle, write what the piece of terrain is and put it on there. And any other little special rules, write them on there. You got enough to remember with your army. Make the terrain easy. Now, we said how you practice by yourself, and we spent a lot of time right now just talking about the terrain layout, which is very, very, very important. If you're looking to go to a tournament, the tournament will probably tell you what missions they're going to run in what order with what secondaries and everything else. So you'll have a very strong, good layout. If you're playing casually and you're playing with a friend, 
try and establish that ahead of time. What are we looking at playing? What are we going to do? And especially if you're just learning the game, run the same mission a couple of times. Get used to it a bit. Try to stay away from some of the ones that remove objective markers or add objective markers. Try and stay away from those. Keep it simple on the table initially. Try to keep all those things simple initially while learning the game and try to stay with the same type of deployment. Now, if you're learning the game and you're staying into the same deployments, I recommend staying with Table Corners, Hammer and Anvil, or Dawn of War. Hammer and Anvil is long ways fighting where you get a short table edge as your side. Dawn of War is the long table edge where you have a much wider spread to put your army, but a shorter zone. And then you have table corners, which puts you into a table quarter to fight against your opponent. These play styles translate well over into the other two deployment styles and are a lot less of a pain in the butt to measure out initially while you're learning the game, especially later on when some of the secondaries apply for your opponent's deployment zone. These are a lot easier to figure out when models have been moved. So again, try to keep it simple while learning the game and learning what you want to do and how the missions interact and how to play the game. After a while and after you've built to this, then you can move on to some of the more difficult missions, maybe drawing random missions as it goes, et cetera, et cetera, different things like that. But initially, try to simplify it. The armies, the game is already complex enough. Take out some of those curves. Run the same mission multiple times the same way. This way, <laughs> you and your friend or you and your opponent can start to build an understanding of the opposing army as well as how they want how their army should play in that mission. And then if you're playing Hammer and Anvil, bam, snap over to Dawn of War and you're going to feel a major difference between how that arm, how that plays. And that may cause you to make some changes to your list. You know, depending on how the game play goes. And then you're going to learn more. And in those two segments, that's how you're going to accelerate your army understanding of what your faction can do while playing the game is if you run the same mission over and over again. Now, once again, we haven't really touched on how you can do this all by yourself or why you would want to do this by yourself. When you're playing against your opponent, a friend, uh, an opponent in a tournament, any whichever, whatever like that, they may have a couple of critical units that you really need to know where they are. But aside from that, aside from a few critical units, most of the time, your opponent's deployment is not really going to predicate where you put things. I know that I've seen some competitive matchups where people have felt discouraged because a high-level player that is a named person is just already deployed half their army and you're putting one down, unit down, looking over, going, oh, oh, it, it's my turn. Oh, I'm seven behind. Oh, I'm this. It's not an insult. It's as you play it more, you start to understand that your opponent's deployment doesn't affect you as much. You may look over and see one threatening unit. And that's the one threatening unit that you want to know where it's going to go before you put down your threatening. And as you do the math, you realize you're not going to be able to out-deploy. So your unit's going to get put down first or vice versa, in which case you may go and say, okay, I put seven units down, deploy, and then after they put that one unit down, that one unit you care about, then you can finish off to configure your deployment based on that. That is still a scenario. But most of the time, your deployment is going to be just that your deployment. So what you can do is if you're playing Dawn of War, and we'll use that as an example right now so we can, looking right here at, at what we have here, I'll move my <clears throat> Pumpkin King trophy. Thank you, Lane. Great idea. <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll just make the 10-inch mark for Dawn of War. And we'll just put a couple dice out here for this setup. Now, when we look at this, this mission uh, that was originally set up with the Dawn of War style, we have the objective markers here, we have objective marker there. So the home objective marker is right in the center. 
with this deployment style, that's very good because of the fact that we have this rune that goes from here over to here. So we're protected with that piece of terrain. How else do we wish to play the game? From this point in looking at the table, and this is why I say it's very important to put the entire table together and out here, I'm able to see that my opponent has an excellent, excellent line of sight right down here, where now we're talking about from this corner all the way across, they have a 50 inch threat range. So extended long range units can get into that corner and really, really put bearing down onto this section. The question I ask you is in this section, there usually will be a center objective that they can put the fire onto. But what else is going on? What else are they looking at that they could potentially be a threat to? The second objective over here. So now, because I know that, because I look at this and realize that there is an objective marker in the center, an objective marker on my left or my opponent's right, uh, that means that this is, a, this is a threatening position that my opponent could be in in this type of table deployment, in this style. And we'll assume for all intents and purposes that this is a tournament that I'm attending, attempting to go to, and this is the mission, and this is how the terrain is going to be deployed and everything. So for all intents and purposes, we'll assume that. So now, since I know that, now I look at my list. Do I match that long-range fire? Can I put that heat down downfield? Typically, with my Necrons, I will probably have my Doomstalkers. So this would not be a bad place for me to put the Doomstalkers. Now, in my mind, the Doomstalker moves seven inches. And being able to get plus one to hit off heavy is nice, but typically I'm going to have a Conoptic Control Node or the Sovereign nearby to give them plus one. So for the Doomstalkers, I'm going to typically want to place them somewhere where seven inches moves them and they can fire down that lane, but they're not getting shot on the first turn. Now, with that being said, what have I now created? I have created a realm where I know that my opponent can go from here long ways this way, and now I can do the same. I can match them shot for shot this way-ish, and also put heat onto this other objective over here. So, with that being said, do I want to? where do we mount our offensive? Do we go left or do we go right? Going over to the left is going directly into where my opponent is putting their fire into, which means that a very defensive, strong, tough unit could use the rune over here to march on that objective and draw that firepower over into that unit, forcing them to react because now I'm closing in and taking that objective. This one over here is going to be a lot less defended. My opponent is going to need to either engage me with close combat units because there's a lot of terrain in their way, and that one can probably be marked with smaller, less, with less, I should say, just in general, just less units. So for this, I would take my army and I would deploy it out on the table. And the next thing I would do is run turn one. Run turn one from going first, run turn one from going second. And you might say, well, how can I go second if I don't know what my opponent's going to do? And to honestly answer that, your opponent's not going to do very much. Most armies right now in Warhammer 40k don't initially, don't hit so hard off turn one. Yes, I know there are exceptions with uh, Tyranids and their style of deployment, uh, Gene Stealer Cult, and even World Eaters. There is exceptions to that rule of being able to hit you on the first turn and remove certain units. And so that's why we build our screens. And that's what you take, we take into consideration. So I'm going to deploy my army down on the table. And I'm going to look at where I can fit everything and how everything fits to be defensively. Now, I've deployed on this already before. And we're gonna, I'm going to use my Xeris build as the example for this. My Xeris build runs two 20-man Necron Warrior squads. And for that, we're just going to use two Necron Warrior models. Now, for that being said, I have those, again, the two objectives on the left and right. Now, I haven't been talking about the middle at all. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, and there's a reason why. 
Now, in this build, I don't have Lich Guard. So I may not go after the center. But when I look at this mission, what I'm going to be doing is, does my opponent want to shoot me? Or does my opponent want to fight me in combat? If my opponent wants to shoot me, then that's when we're going to make this a easy tag where I'm going to use units like Tomb Blades or Ophidian Destroyers or even one of my new friends, Death Marks, and be able to deep strike the Death Marks onto the objective in the corner to take that objective. So in my mind, looking at this, I can get the Death Marks into a position where while they may not be able to gun something down, they can hold that objective. Okay, now, what about secondaries, like engage on all fronts and stuff like that? So let's get these guys, we're going to put them try over here and try and move them into a position where they're in my opponent's quarter for engage on all fronts, approaching for behind enemy lines, but three inches from that center, able to just barely tag that objective. Can, uh, scarabs can do similar with this. Obviously, they can't control the objective, but they can move around that same flank being the fact that this is more a, a heavy, heavy terrain hold. Now, the more they move out, the more firing lanes I'm able to give here in the middle. So how do I get past that? So now what I'm able to do and what I'm able to see is by placing the Necron Warriors at the shortest distance possible behind the ruin where they cannot be seen, that first move with the Necron Warrior is going to bring him right up here on top of my piece, on top of my piece of terrain. In order for him to get to that center objective marker or to just tag it, he's going to need another four inches. Now I can advance. That's not bad. If I need a four to advance to tag that objective marker, or we can base it on reanimation. Personally, I would probably advance with the unit. Now let's say we advance and we fail. Even if we advance and fail and we only move two inches move a little bit closer. Now we play our reanimation game. Now we can use the cover from the terrain behind us to provide us a better save or feel no pain from our Technomancer, if he's there, to be able to now reanimate and resurrect these guys to be able to tag that objective super early with objective control value two units and continue to push. So when I look at that, excuse me, when I look at that setup, and we start to move towards the middle on there. And I look at that, I realize on turn two, the beginning, the command phase, I have a very strong possibility of holding the center objective mark. Now, my opponent chooses to not shoot at that unit for reanimation sakes, which a savvy player may just do so. Then we have to wait one more turn. But typically, that means my opponent is now not being aggressive at this unit that can now come back and be aggressive. Now, in this build, I do have Zerus. So Zerus, he's going to come in, and he's going to be somewhere over here. Now, he has lone operative and a heck of a move. Now, why is he over here, though? Because that other warrior squad I want to bring over onto this objective, and we're going to do the exact same thing with We're going to put that exact, this warrior squad over here and allow them. Now, they're behind the rune, and they're going to use that rune to start marching up there. And if they have failed their advance, too, to be able to tag that objective, they can still stay in the room. We'll put this guy up here, but he's there within inches to be able to take that. Now, at this point, I might let a couple of them play out there to kind of bait my opponent into shooting at them, because if they, again, if they shoot at them, I can reanimate onto that objective. So now, in my mindset, I'm looking at this. I have Zerus here, who he moves up, still keeping protected by the runes, also has uh, lone operative protection for needing to be within 12 inches having some warrior bricks that are going to make it difficult to be able to get onto them and giving armor a contempt to those guys. So now we're in a good position for that. Looking at this and looking at that turn one, looking at that move, knowing what I have with the death marks. I also in this list have a fitting destroyers, score pack destroyers, which I know, I know, but I love them and they work with this list. A catacomb command barge, a canoptic reanimator. Big one there, Canoptic Reanimator. Where does he play from? Pretty easy. Right behind the room. Can't be seen. And then uh, <clears throat> marches, because typically the Canoptic Reanimator is five inches tall. Typically these are five inches tall to be qualified as rune. Yes, I know they're slightly shorter, but it's, again, agreed upon between me and Lane because, man, 
You put a lot of work in these things, they look great. So now at this point, now the reanimator, I look at its 12 inch measurement and I see how much his reanimation bubble can cover and where he needs to be. So from that corner, he's in a really good position. He can now move around the outside if we're able to push and start moving up towards that center objective to keep him safe in between the two to be able to provide that reanimation buff to all those units nearby. Catacomb Command Barge has a similar role to be able to provide a resurrection orb for these guys, so he'll probably be in the same area. So as we start to build this, and as we start putting these units down, and we bring the Necron Warriors back, and we bubble them up and put them really tight there, and we bring the Warriors back, and we bubble them up tight, and we have them here. Now we can start looking at some of these other units before getting to the table and going, okay, where do I want to put these things now? Scorepec would do very, very well to be able to take this objective like we were discussing. So I may put the Scorepex in this piece of rune to be able to march up and be able to hit that objective marker as well. Ophidian Destroyers. Ophidian Destroyers are in lists. They come off. They're able to do a lot with objective games. So these guys are going to probably be in the last thing I deploy to be in the most horrible English here to have the biggest advantage as far as visibility is concerned. Haha, -ha, made it happen. And the reason being is they don't, they can go in a corner for all it matters. They just need to not be able to be seen. And having them in these corners means our opponent also needs to be in the corners to shoot at them. And we're talking about 44 inches across that. Now, obviously, the model's not going to be completely in the corner, it has to be off the board. But even when you get to a 38 inch range, you're getting a lot safer with it too. And there's nice little spots I can see like right here where it's really difficult to see. And right over here too, that still hides from that death lane that we talked about early on and puts us in position to be able to pick them up and put them back down on those later terms of the game. Uh, my scarabs in this list typically go in strategic preserve because they're part of my engage on all front plays. And then we also have a single hex mark that also goes in deep strike just to deep strike down somewhere around these guys and provide protection. And so that's going to, and, that, and that's going to be something to also, I'm going to want to think about is where's that hex mark going to get into it. For me, I would like to see the hex mark come in right around here to be able at any one that shoots, I'm shooting back and shooting back, but he may end up being over here close to that center objective or off to the side in the corner. Same deal. I think off to the side is going to be kind of a waste. So it'll probably be more centralized so that he's able to pick up more shots off more units that could hit. Um, so we've covered a lot of this into my, my Zerus build and how these units all interact and where they come in here and where they're able to move. Now, I don't have Tomb Blades in this list because of the Ophidians and the Death Marks in that way. Uh, Tomb Blades are definitely still on the table. Being able to scout move and everything is a beautiful thing, and I cannot say that it isn't, but it's just the way I've gone with this build. Now, from here, what I've done is I've, all I've done is played out a little bit of turn one and looked into this as far as how I could play this list going into turn one and where these units can go. This is critical. This is super critical to understanding how the army works. You know, we put together these lists with these different combinations and different tricks in them. And when you put them on the table, sometimes you end up running into yourself, running over yourself, trampling your own units, trampling your own models, or worse, blocking your own lanes with your own vehicles. Doing this really helps you see later into the game and what you're able to do later into the game. Now, we only said turn one and being able to maybe tag on turn two. So what happens turn three, turn four, and turn five? Well, in these turns, now we're looking at the game of how do we expand? So this objective marker to my right, I'm not expecting to hold. I'm expecting that my opponent is going to try to take it from me and I may let them have it. Where is everything else going? Well, the score packs that I said I'd probably deploy right here are going to be able to move through using the cover and the protection of the rune, as so, and not be able to be seen in our death firing lane. 
if it's easy enough, we can move the score packs over onto that objective and take it back. If not, the score packs are in a fast enough position, and I'm able to know this because I'll pre-measure the infantry. So right here on my <clears throat> right here on the table edge line, we have a seven inch move puts us right here. We can advance with these guys because it doesn't really matter. So let's give him an extra three inches. Just keep it easy. So now he's getting a good position against the rune, able to move him forward. We go into the next turn. Seven inches from this guy puts him just outside of that objective marker. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome charge into anything that's on that objective. At the same time, seven inches here, puts him directly on the objective marker to the corner, being able to pick those back up. This is where you're able to start getting that bigger view of things. And at that same time, maybe see something go, wow, I'm going to fumble all over myself. Now, in this list, I don't have the Doomstalkers like I was talking about down this lane. So I don't really not as worried about trying to hold down that firing lane. I want my warriors to get hit so I can start reanimating for it. I don't want them to get swept, but I want them to get hit, beat up a little bit so they can start reanimating forward to be able to score those early points. Because with this list and in this position, I could end up holding all three objective markers in the middle on turns two and three aggressively. Meaning that if my opponent is able to push me back, is able to clear the warriors, and is able to really put the hurt into me, I may have put them at a point that their primary game is so stifled after losing two turns of primary. Because now, in most of these scenarios, with most of the scoring, we only score four turns of primary. There are some stipulations with being able to kill some, kill more, that allow you to score first turn primary. But typically, we score primary for four turns. And if I can knock my, if I can score high on primary two turns in a row and knock my opponent down to only scoring one primary objective marker for two turns, on turn four and five, even if they clear me off of one or two objectives, I can still be able to hold two objectives in some way, shape, or form to keep my primary game over theirs going into the final turns. Also at the same time too, with the abilities that the Aphidians have, I know that keeping them and using them late in the game allows me to score secondaries that in other scenarios I may not be able to. We have access in Necrons to a one command point strat that can make a unit not only reroll its advance, but count as assault on the weapons on the turn that they advance if they're led by a character. This is efficient for being able to put down shooting, but it's even more efficient on the realm of being able to do secondaries that you may not have been able to already do, typically. So this is where that turn one comes in, the turn one and deploying and being able to do this by yourself. Because now, when I look at this and I look at this vision of this, now I've been playing this army a bunch and this is one of my more competitive builds. I can look at this and ask myself, okay, what do I do if my opponent completely crashes their entire army onto this flank? Well, again, the score pack is able to move to center and I can let that flank go. You can have that objective. Because now I've put your entire army over here and now when I say hold these two objectives and I was saying for two turns, now I'm looking at holding a triangle for three turns or more. And if we get three turns of primary scoring, we're basically winning on primary if we can hold it that deep. If my opponent decides they want to crash center, how do we play off that and what do we do? In this scenario, I would let them crash center and as I reanimate my skeletons, my Necron warriors, I'm going to reanimate back to my home field objective to try to bog my opponent down and now circle the map. The score packs may go into the corners and try to hold those two objectives out there. Because once again, if my opponent's dedicated in the center, yes, they may try and make a push right down the middle and take my home objective. And that's strong for um, secondary purposes, especially for storm enemy outpost. But if they're doing that and they're pushing that heavy, we can do it too. By being able to hold these side corner objectives with the score packs, which are a quicker unit, as well as having access to the Ophidians, I know that I'm able that the more they push down the middle, 
I'm able to come around the outsides quick enough, not very fast, but quick enough to then take their home field objective and switch sides with them, especially with having units like the Ophidians available, Hexmark and Deathmarks to do work. So this allows me to see all in all, not only how I will deploy the army, but if the army can even be deployed to handle these scenarios and what ways I need to move into those to get into turns three and four. So some changes that may occur is again, if we do run into an army that I look at that is gonna crash center, this squad of Necron warriors may creep to the right. They may be deployed more into this death zone and creep over to the right because now if my opponent is planning on crashing that center, they probably don't have as much shooting. They might have a little bit, but not a crazy amount. And even so, not really enough shooting to take out the warriors because they're pushing the center. So this gives me the ability now to take the warriors and be able to break them left and right. What does Zerus do? Zerus picks the weaker of the two flanks to join because he's able to buff them significantly. Not to mention the fact that don't sleep on Zerus. He is very, very, very resilient in his own right. It is ideal to keep him near both Necron Warrior squads, which means in most scenarios, it would be ideal in my builds, in my play, to try to take center. But that may not be the case. And in that case, if that is the sense, I have one of two choices. Either A, creep on that right objective, or B, let the Necron Warrior stay and hold the home field objective and hopefully hold it late when we get hit to be able to slow down the whatever squad is trying to take that home field objective long enough that although they take down the warriors, I've tar pitted them long enough. And that probably be the way that I would consider playing it. So I look at this and go, okay, if I'm getting hit and my warriors are staying back here to protect and Zerus is gonna stay here more in the in middle to hold the two, and the reanimator as well. Now I want to advance more aggressively there, more score packs might find their way in this building to be able to take that objective to the right. As well as the fact that, as I stated with the Ophidians, Ophidians being able to pick up if they play, if there's no aggression played on this objectives, squad of Ophidians land and take them real nice and easy. And they're quick. So the Ophidians can then get in the corners if need be for other secondaries later on. All right, this is how I look at 40K and how I practice when I'm uh, late at night, when I'm just having ideas. And this is one of the reasons I want to start doing these segments is to kind of ponder over this stuff. Like I come down to my basement, I'm working on an army list <clears throat> and I put it out on the table and I'm by myself. And so instead, I want to kind of share this with the community so the community can share their thoughts back as well, too on some of these different lists, some of these deployments, some of these builds. Moving forward, I do plan on taking some of the lists and actually putting them on the table. But for this segment, I just wanted to talk about how to practice 40K. So you can go home, you go to your table, you go there, you take your list, you bring it up, you go, okay. So I'm playing a game this weekend. I know I'm going up against Space Marines. I know he's got two Gladiator Lancers. All right, so he's gonna put those Lancers probably there. He's going to shoot down this lane. All right, so how do I play around that? How can I get through this? Where am I going to deploy this stuff? And it's not necessarily like it's going to be like, oh, this, is, this will guarantee you the win in that matchup. But what it will do is it will, make, it will give you a more fun game. Because then when you start, when you put everything down there and you go, man, I got a lot of stuff. You might look at that and go, okay, I need to get some of this off the table. Or I need to change up some of these units. Maybe I can just invest more points into one. This is where Lich Guard become very valuable in that realm. And start to push that army and make it tighter, more compact, and able to maneuver the field back. And that's going to be crucial. It's going to be crucial not only for you, but also for your opponent too, when you know what your stuff's doing and what you're trying to get to and where you're trying to, you're trying to make happen. Well, I hope this video was informative. Um, this is... Uh, 40k is something I'm definitely very passionate about. I definitely look forward to making more videos like this, especially going directly over some more of my armies and army plays uh, and some of the builds that I have, as well as, again, all the battle reports and other 40k content we're bringing on the table. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed. 
and I look forward to making some more videos again soon. Talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching.